Dennis, I want to get right to President Trump. To me, I think this is really a bit of a distraction, but I will tell you there are many former Fed officials and um, Fed watchers who are really alarmed by the president even saying anything about being displeased with Fed rate hikes, so it's not too surprising to me. What about you? Is this a concern? From a policy point of view, I, I, it's not a concern to me because I have full confidence that the committee, the Federal Open Market Committee, will simply set policy in the best long-term interest of the country and of the economy, and I think they will uh, do their very best to ignore uh, outside pressures. So let's move on to another thing that caused a little bit of a stir today, the dropping the word accommodative from the policy statement when describing mm -hmm. the stance of monetary policy. And actually, this had been signaled by the Fed prior to this, Bonds rally, though, they think, oh, the Fed, if they don't think policy is accommodative, they're closely, <clears throat> closer to think it's restrictive, and that means they won't hike rates as much. Jay Powell downplayed that at the press conference. He said, just, we just don't need it anymore. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I noted in the press conference that Chairman Powell uh, tried to uh, explain it in such a way that people will not overreact to the removal of the word accommodative. Uh, he said, and I think it's true, that that sentence had been in the statement for a long time and it simply out, you, outlived its usefulness and had become a little bit stale. And arguably the committee is now in a little bit different phase where they are trying to sustain conditions. Uh, so the sentence no longer was as useful as it was earlier in the process. So. Where do you think the Fed is in the process of hiking rates? You know, if we want to jump into the terminal, I can pull up an easy chart, Dennis. It's dots go. It's just looking at the mm -hmm. stop plots. And now I'm circling, boy, oh, boy, we've got uh, a total of 12 out of 16 now who are saying we're on board with one more rate hike. You know, then you get into uh, next year and you get a, a number that's more like three. Does the Fed really need to hike rates that much? I know it's not a promise they're going to do it. It's just they think what they think is what might happen now based on what they see. But do you see a risk they do too much? Well, I think your, your, first, your chart shows that there is a very strong consensus for a rate hike in December, assuming the economy continues on the track it's on. So I would say that's a very high likelihood. I looked at the dots uh, uh, earlier today and what I saw in 2019 was four at two moves, four at three moves, and four at four moves. That tells me that there is a consensus that there will be more moves, but not a, a real strong consensus yet as to how many. So uh, I think they're going to feel their way along toward a notion of neutral and I'm sure you're going to ask the question about Kevin Warsh's article, <laughs> the, the notion of neutral. Uh, and they will probe and then decide whether to pause at that point or to go further. Well, quickly then, you, you, you almost asked the question for us. Former Fed Governor yeah. Warsh saying this neutral rate concept is a waste of time. It's misleading. The Fed should drop it. Do you agree? I don't, I don't entirely agree. I'll, I'll, I'll make two points. First, it is an estimate. It's not anything that's observable and pre therefore precise uh, as an economic tool, but it's a useful estimate of where policy is uh, at equilibrium, where it's neither restrictive uh, nor uh, stimulative. I, I think you, you have to have something like that in mind to guide policy in the current mm. economy. The second point I would make, which I think is a very important point, is if you accept it as having some efficacy as a, as a tool, it, the estimate has come down by 150 to 200 basis points over the last three or four years, which is another way of saying economists believe that what constitutes neutral over the long term is a lot lower than it was in the past. That suggests a, a somewhat more slow-moving right. economy with you know, demographic drags and that kind of thing. So I think there's some usefulness uh, 
to the idea of a neutral rate. Let's talk about the economic environment right now because the FOMC raised their GDP forecast for next year. They seem to brush off the trade dispute, the tariffs. Were they right to do so? Well, they're not seeing any evidence in the data yet of influence of the trade disputes going on. It's probably too early. Uh, I think Chairman Powell cited the anecdotal feedback that many of the Fed presidents have gotten when they take soundings in their various districts. And I think that tells you that the Fed is paying attention to this. But there's no evidence yet that it's affecting the economy. The economy is really quite strong. Uh, employment continues strong. Inflation is in a good zone. So there is no reason to react, react at this point to the prospect of some disturbance from trade. I think they will wait until they see real evidence. Is, is real evidence or is real transmission uh, and disturbance inevitable, though? I mean, is there any sort of useful historical precedent that we see what uh, central bank policymaking should look like in the event of a trade war? And should we assume that sooner or later we're going to see this show up as being a short-term spike in inflation and longer-term stagflationary effects? Uh, that's a really good question. I, I'm not aware of trade matters having had a material effect on the economy in the past. I could be very wrong about that. I need to go back and check my history. But I will point out <laughs> that trade, uh, U.S. economy is not highly dependent on trade. So net exports, which is the economic data point that is followed, is uh, important, but it's not nearly as important as domestic consumption and business investment. So we could have a fairly severe trade kind of situation, and it at least first order effect might not be that big on the U.S. economy. Then you have to factor in consumer confidence in those circumstances, factor in market reaction, second order effects if we get into a really really mm -hmm. bitter, bitter trade war. Well, you know, very different uh, problems, of course, when we look at trade and try to guess the impact on the economy. Then when you were president of the Atlanta Fed, part of this policy making uh, by the Fed, uh, very different issues now. But one thing that hasn't changed, you talk about checking history. Many times, and this is the markets I think are concerned about, Fed's mistake is to do too much. Fed's mistake is not able to know when it hits neutral and keep going on rate hikes. Is there a risk that could happen this time? Well, policy, policy is always set in a context of a, really a lot of uncertainty. And um, some of the tools are, are, let us say, you know, less than precise. And so they're trying to navigate. I think that's the term that Jay Powell used in the Jackson Hole speech, and it's a good term. They're navigating in a, in a situation of uncertainty between uh, bad outcomes on both sides. And it's, it's never a sure thing. So yes, something could happen. But I think the current approach of gradual increase in, ra in, in rates that are calibrated to the strength of the economy and to the inflation and employment situation is a very uh, solid, it's very predictable for the markets. Uh, and therefore, I think it's, a, it's a, a very good path that they have carved out. That is, you know, the U.S. may be able to ring fence the effects of a trade war because, as you point out, it's not super trade dependent anymore. But the effects are playing out pretty clearly here in Asia and some of the supply chain hubs around the world. I thought it was interesting. There was a comment from the Bank of International Settlements earlier this week saying that the global economy is looking precarious and central bankers, because of ultra accommodative policies, are now in a position where they're powerless to be able to do anything very much. Do you agree with that? Well, certainly it's a concern that the first thing you would do in the event of a downturn would be to cut rates. And if the neutral rate is around 3 percent, uh, that doesn't give them a lot of room to, to move. And they would have to, once they get to zero, they would have to come up with other, uh, other 
policy tools if they felt that they needed to add more accommodation, more stimulus to the economy. That is, a, I think, a, a really important difference from or compared to earlier episodes. So when I joined the Fed in 2007, the Fed funds rate was, I believe, five and a quarter percent. And by December of 2008, it was zero, or effectively zero. So there was lots of firepower in the ability to cut rates. In a future scenario, not probably not so much. And therefore, central banks are either going to have to be more resourceful, they're going to have to rely more on convincing the public in terms of uh, forward guidance or communication that th things are going to turn. But they don't have the strongest tools compared to previous situations.